I'm JJ O'Neinen, and I'm the uh, managing partner of Trump O'Neinen Co. I'm also the vice president for uh, the uh, private sector steering committee and the in-house lawyers for the South Asian Bar Association in New York. We have a lot of folks joining us today from uh, the South, Bar, South Asian Bar Association nationwide. In addition to this is being uh, uh, recorded by Via TV, which is the largest uh, Indian network uh, in the U.S. So uh, we're very excited to have you here today. Uh, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy was elected in November of 2016 to represent the 8th District of Illinois, which includes the west and northwest suburbs of Chicago. Uh, Congressman Krishnamurthy serves on the Oversight Committee, which is very important now, for which he is also the chairman of the Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, as well as the House Intelligence Committee. In addition to this committee work, Congressman Krishnamurthy uh, was selected as an assistant whip and serves on the Steering and Policy Committee. Congressman Krishnamurthy graduates summa cum laude from Princeton University with a degree in mechanical engineering and a certificate from Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy. He then graduated with honors from Harvard Law School and clerked for a federal judge before practicing law in Chicago as a partner at Kirkland Ellis. He was the policy director uh, for former President Barack Obama during his Senate campaign in the early 2000s. Uh, Congressman Chris Murthy pursued public service while practicing law and was appointed by the Illinois Attorney General as a special assistant attorney general to help start the state's public integrity unit created to root out corruption in Illinois. Congressman Krishnamurthy, welcome, and thank you so much in participating in this fireside chat with the South Asian Bar Association. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you're balancing the pressure of people that want to uh, earn a living wage and, and, the need, and the need to getting back to earning that living wage. How are you weighing these numbers? Is there a way that, uh, that it's safe to go outside? Um, I think that you're getting at kind of a fundamental question on everyone's minds, which is, you know, how do we get past this pandemic and get back to work, uh, open our businesses and reopen the economy? And I think right now, um, at least in a lot of folks' minds, including mine, is you have to pr preserve and protect people's health and welfare first, above all else. And while we basically put the uh, economy into a medically induced coma, you know, we have to do everything in Congress to provide resources to keep the patient alive. That means working families, that means businesses, that means uh, everyone else, uh, so that, you know, uh, when it's time to wake up the patient and get them going again, people will be ready. Um, it's going to require a lot of government resources. Um, and uh, I understand the um, issues related to the long-term debt, but right now we have to survive. So let's first deal with the pandemic and the health, uh, the health crisis we have. Let's keep people economically viable. And then let's get to the other side and, and, and get people back to work and reopen the economy as fully as we can, even in the absence of a vaccine, which may be a year away still. So COVID has had a dramatic impact um, on, on each and every one of our daily lives. So what are some of these lessons that the government should be taking away from the moment? Great question. I think that um, there, there are a couple things that we uh, have taken away right, you know, uh, from the, from the get-go, which is um, we were not prepared for this pandemic, and uh, we absolutely have to be for the next one. And I think uh, we would be um, fooling ourselves if we didn't think that there, there's a chance of another one. And then secondly, we have to organize ourselves and have the infrastructure to be able to work from home and do the other things to keep ourselves productive. Um, I'm heartened that uh, while we've made some steps in the direction of good uh, distance learning, uh, it's not perfect. <laughs> and as a parent of three children, I can tell you, uh, you know, uh, we, we've, we've seen uh, very uh, uneven uh, kind of systems in that regard. I think telemedicine is going to become a much more uh, prevalent form of uh, treatment as well. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of technologies, everything from virtualization and, and other uh, ways of connecting without being physically present, start to uh, emerge more 
uh, on the landscape. And I think that's something that government has to look, look at as well and, and uh, take seriously, including in the courts, <laughs> uh, as yeah. you know. Yeah. Is that something uh, Priya is doing currently? Is she uh, practicing telemedicine or is she going into uh, the hospitals? No, she actually has to go to the hospitals and, and part of her duties are um, she has to intubate COVID patients in the ICU. Um, she's an anesthesiologist. So, you know, a lot of anesthesiologists are kind of tasked with that right now. So, uh, you know, I'm, I and probably a lot of you are saying an extra prayer for our uh, frontline responders and health healthcare workers. Of course, 100%. Uh, what mitigation efforts are being put into place now for when the economy is reopened? Well, I think that there, there, there are a number of measures that we have to take. Uh, one is uh, we have to engage in wide-scale testing. Um, we have to then do wide-scale contact tracing. And then we have to uh, enable for uh, isolation and treatment of those people. Let me focus in on the testing for a second because it's so crucial. Um, while we provided resources for this particular um, issue in the last CARES package, um, I call it CARES 3.5, what we voted on last uh, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, I have uh, deep concerns about the quality of testing, um, especially serological testing uh, or antibody testing, which a lot of people are hoping is going to be the key to our um, wide-scale reopening of the economy. Unfortunately, uh, through my work as chair of my subcommittee, oversight subcommittee, we've discovered that the FDA is allowing um, a flood of unregulated fraudulent tests to dominate the marketplace. And so we have to police that. We have to make sure that whatever testing is out there is high quality uh, because the consequences could be very grave uh, if people take faulty tests and act uh, based on false results. And Congressman Chris Murphy, yeah, it was reported that uh, about 120 manufacturers were uh, approved just through the uh, through the FDA for uh, through self validation. What are you, as the, your chair of your subcommittee within the oversight committee, doing um, to you know uh, you know eradicate these tests? And you know, are you are you writing to the uh, FDA? Are you uh, uh, trying to develop new policy related to it? What 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 are what steps are you taking um, from the government's position? To, to, to help eradicate these tests? Yes, both of those things. Actually, we uh, just yesterday we wrote a letter to Commissioner Hahn of the FDA basically saying, look, you've got to rescind this policy of allowing um, hundreds of unregulated and uh, faulty tests to uh, come onto the marketplace. You need to clear the market of all these tests. You need to allow only authorized tests to be utilized by the American public. And then you need to give clear standards for what those test results actually mean, because um, it turns out that the science is still a little bit unsettled as to what the presence of COVID-19 antibodies uh, confer in the way of immunity, how long it lasts, what, what can it allow you to do and not do and so forth. So that's what I've asked the FDA to do. And then separately, because the FDA has not acted, um, I and my committee have acted, We've issued letters yesterday to four more makers of faulty tests, um, asking them to produce uh, information and data validating their test results. Um, and so this is not something that I should be doing or my committee should be doing, but if the FDA will not act, we will. Uh, Congressman Christian, the, the, one of the other uh, parts of it, it was contact tracing uh, that you had mentioned. What efforts is the federal government putting to place related to contact uh, tracing uh, when, when they reopen the economy? Or what are they doing now, for example? Unfortunately, they're not doing much, if anything at all. Um, and this is going to be a very labor-intensive, time-intensive effort. A few states have taken up the task seriously. I think Massachusetts hired 1,000 people just to trace the contacts of people who tested COVID. Uh, to learn who may be exposed and who may need to be tested. And so we need to scale this up um, as a nationwide effort. Um, unfortunately, a lot of states don't have the resources to do this. And that's why in part I'm advocating so strongly for aid to states and local governments as part of the next package, 
because um, if they don't have these resources, not only will they not be able to do contact tracing, uh, they'll have to cut services. Um, and that means uh, at the local level, fire, police, sanitary, um, and public health uh, related services that are vital to uh, combating the epidemic. So in the next piece of legislation uh, in stimulus package 4.5 perhaps, right, you're, right, planning, right. You're, you're, planning on, you're planning on trying to get some money towards the states. Um, yes. or, you know, I see that uh, in, you know, at least being reported that there's, uh, you know, President Trump wants to put some restrictions on these, uh, on, on, right. on getting money to the states. Uh, have you seen pushback from the other side um, uh, related to this currently? Yes. Um, and, and it started with Mitch McConnell, who said that states um, could declare bankruptcy if they're facing, uh, you know, pressures that they can't deal with. And, uh, you know, I think that your governor, Governor Cuomo, said it best uh, at one of his, uh, you know, excellent press conferences when he said, you know, you know, you, you go, he dared Mitch McConnell to offer that as an option and see what that would do to the, the markets and the economy. It would, it would basically destabilize the economy. And the fact of the matter is, although people like uh, Mitch McConnell and others call it a blue state problem, it's actually an all state problem. It's an issue that every community, uh, town and city that I'm uh, aware of in every state is going to be dealing with. Um, look, pandemic expenses are through the roof. Nobody had budgeted money for PPE. Nobody had budgeted money to buy thousands of ventilators. And then on top of it, their, their sales tax revenue and other forms of revenue are drying up very quickly. And so um, because at the local level, especially the municipal level, they don't have access to capital the same way that um, bigger governments might have, and they have to balance their budgets every year, uh, including sometimes in, you know, on a cash basis. Um, they just have to cut, cut services, cut uh, workers. And what we learned from the last great recession is when you do that, you deepen the recession. And that's the worst thing in the world that we could do right now. And Congressman Christmer, the, uh, you talked about the, the, the last great recess, recession. This morning, it was reported that the GDP of uh, the U.S. dropped by 4.8%, which is the largest um, uh, percent drop since the Great Recession, I think in 2009. And a, re a recession is any two consecutive uh, yes. quarters where, you know, you, you have a drop. And in, in this particular situation, do yes. you see us hitting that recession uh, this time around because of COVID? And what measures are, is the government putting into place now so we could um, you know, get out of the recession as quickly as possible? Regrettably, I think we're gonna be entering a recession in this quarter, the second quarter. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, according to the New York Times, what I read in the New York Times today, um, you know, economists are predicting upwards of a 20 to 30% drop in GDP in the second quarter. So, you know, we had a 4.8% drop in the first quarter and we're looking at another 20 to 30% drop in this quarter. Uh, you're starting to verge on depression-like economic performance. Now, if we do this right, if we um, observe the stay-at-home orders, if we do um, what we have to do to combat the pandemic and engage in wide-scale testing, and tracing and treatment, I do believe that we can reopen uh, sectors of the economy, maybe not um, to the fullest extent possible. Maybe we can't have you know, 40, 50,000 people in one place in a, in, a, in a stadium, for instance, or a rock concert. I, I don't know, I don't know the science about that yet. But in other ways, I do think that we can get back to work and um, you know, it might require some social distancing, which I know everybody's practicing already. It might require wearing masks, um, even at the office. Uh, you know, my office is the, the floor of the United States Congress or the House of Representatives, and I wore a mask um, on the floor, and, every, and most of my colleagues did too. And uh, as I looked around, I thought, okay, well, maybe this is, this is how we're gonna have to get back to work. Uh, at least until we have a vaccine or therapeutic that can uh, deal with the, uh, the, the coronavirus. Congressman Chris Murthy, just to piggyback on that, was, has there been any pro progress on 
uh, Congress be able to vote uh, through proxy or remotely instead of uh, you know dragging you guys into DC to vote in person? Um, interestingly, uh, I think that there's going to be progress on uh, vote by proxy. Um, remote voting uh, systems, uh, I think, will be the future for sure. Uh, they haven't really come up with a techno technological solution for that yet. But I think proxy voting, I hope, is in the offing because it doesn't make any sense for us to be, you know, coming from 435 different places in the country, bringing all the germs that <laughs> that entails to one place and then spreading them around. It doesn't make any sense. So um, hopefully we can get to a better place. Chris, I know you have a lot of involvement with uh, Social Security. Uh, and so I have a question related to that. Social Security has taken a, you know, a hit as a consequence of COVID, uh, obviously. Um, can you explain how you would work uh, to secure Social Security now? And are there permanent changes to Social Security that we should consider to keep it going um, forward and strong? Um, I think that uh, what I've learned with Social Security is you, uh, you tinker with it very, very carefully. Because what I learned in the last Great Recession is that Social Security checks oftentimes took care of not only just the senior generation, but oftentimes their adult children and their grandchildren. Sometimes they all moved in uh, in one place in an intergenerational household. And I suspect the same thing's gonna happen this time as, as well. Um, and so we have to do everything we can to prevent an erosion in social security benefits. As for permanent changes, we have talked about some changes. Um, you know, one is potentially raising the cap subject to taxation, the payroll tax. Uh, that seems like a reasonable uh, suggestion, I think. Hopefully, um, I don't know if with this president it's gonna happen, but with, with a future president, I think it will happen. Um, we do have to make some other changes as well. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Krishnamurti, the, the payroll protection program was, uh, was you know, uh, passed last, last month, which you know, would give 2.5X two, two uh, your monthly payroll with a cap of $100,000 um, for the higher paid employees, et cetera, to, be used in categories such as uh, payroll, rent, mortgage interest, insurance. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that we've seen in the past couple of uh, uh, weeks is that there's a, a level of concierge service uh, that lenders are giving to their higher uh, right. network clients yeah. um, and, and, and on, a, on this first come first serve. Is there anything that you and your oversight committee or Congress is doing to um, to protect against these lender issues. Um, and uh, it, was there anything that was passed in the subsequent bill in stimulus four or 3.5, as you said, that would provide the, provide for these uh, protections? Because I've heard that the Lakers, the, the, uh, the Roots Chris, and, and um, I think Shake Shack, they got it. And they're big business, which, has, which have uh, you know, uh, opportunities to get alternative funding that sure. would otherwise not be available to small mom and pop shops. Um, and so what is Congress and the Oversight Committee doing um, to protect against these lender issues? I think three things have to be done. One is we just have to fix some of the underlying legislation. Um, you know, I think that uh, in a rush, uh, there are definitely some errors uh, that made certain entities eligible that should not have been eligible. Uh, namely publicly traded companies. It doesn't make any sense. They have access to capital. A second thing that has to be done is we have to perform oversight with regard to the money that was spent. Unfortunately, uh, we've run into some resistance there uh, with regard to oversight. Um, and I think that just as, a, just as an example, um, your, your uh, viewers may already know this, but the, the Treasury Department will not release the list of either lenders or participants um, in the PPP program, which is completely unacceptable. And so I and others have been pushing very hard for that transparency. And um, I think we need to you know, uh, make sure it's baked into any future PPP um, tranches. And then the last thing that we need to do is um, the Treasury Department um, is uh, 
you know, part of the, the problem here, I think the reason why the smaller small businesses got cut out in part was that a lot of smaller lending institutions were cut out of the program. We've now added them to the program. So credit unions and CDFIs and so forth. And so I hope we can um, make it known on, a, on a, a broad basis who these people are in your local communities and that, you know, whether they're minority owned banks or others are able to take advantage and, and, and get the money out to as many people as possible. And so what steps would, I understand you received some resistance, what steps would you take now? What steps can you or Congress take to uh, obtain those, uh, obtain transparency in, in essence? as to who the lenders are and who the participants are. Well, we're gonna to continue to push and also try to bake it into uh, future legislative text. Um, I think that uh, unfortunately, so far uh, with a lot of things in this administration, we're met with um, you know, uh, resistance and opaqueness. And um, right now we need sunshine and transparency to figure out how can we make this work better for small businesses. You know, I was a small businessman during the last great recession. And so this is of great importance to me. I felt like, you know, the federal government was out for certain large financial institutions and sometimes not necessarily for the 50 person, in my case, a 50, 60 person company, high tech business. And um, so this time around, obviously we need to take care of the financial institutions because that's where our money is. But we should also take care of those small businesses who uh, employ the vast majority of our workforce. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Congressman, um, just to switch gears, um, USCIS has uh, uh, you know, issued very arbitrary um, rulings uh, in, in relaxing the rules related to the delays and extensions and changes of status. Is there anything that works from Congress to help support these legal immigrants who may be out of status related to the um, SARS uh, uh, CoV 2 epidemic? Well, if there's any specific cases, please contact my office and, you, and if you could share my um, office information, uh, we're happy to help you attorneys out there or, or your clients. Um, we have a little, vis little more visibility um, with regard to USCIS and specific cases. As a broad matter, um, we're just in a fight constantly on this issue. Um, I, you may already know this, I mentioned it before, I'm an immigrant myself. And so um, I fight for immigrants uh, as hard as I can every day of the week. Um, and it, with this administration, there is a wing of the White House that um, really is trying to um, uh, do everything in its power to stop not only illegal, but legal immigration. And so uh, that's just a philosophical war that we're fighting. So I would just recommend if there's specific cases, please let me know and we'll try to do our, our best to work through it because there actually are a lot of good public servants and civil servants within USCIS who, you know, they know what the spirit and intent of the laws are and they try to, they try to do their best. Thank you, Congressman Christmas. My, my wife does immigration and uh, she was telling me that, that about Apparently, 200,000 uh, H-1B uh, workers will be out of status. Um, typically, you would, you know, would be uh, by June, and there's nothing you can do because typically you would have to leave the country. And but India won't let them in, for example, because uh, they're also their borders also closed. So they're they're in a bind, or there are a lot of immigrants like that in a bind where they don't have the opportunity to either return to work or return to their home country and maintain their status, for example. So I will you know, share their information. Yeah, please do. And, and that's where we as a group need to advocate for them. Uh, they may not vote, they may not um, uh, have political power, but we do. And we got to exercise it. Uh, Congressman, uh, the term structural change has been thrown around a lot during this election cycle. Uh, what sorts of structural changes does the government need, need to make? Um, structural change. Um, I can think of uh, certain structure, structural change, um, but I don't want to get political. <laughs> um, All right. Look, I think that from a structural standpoint, um, certain things that um, pop up, you know, I, Chairman Schiff, Adam Schiff convened a, a, a meeting of the Intelligence Committee, House Intelligence Committee last uh, Thursday when we were voting. 
And, um, you know, we, two things popped up there, which is what is the definition of national security in the age of pandemics? And um, what, what, what does gathering intelligence look like? Um, you know, we all think of James Bond and, and spies and the CIA when we think of intelligence gathering, but now we're going to have to think of public health workers, nurses, doctors, and others who are, you know, monitoring hotspots and trying to figure out how do we uh, cure the, the situation at the source. That's one structural change. I think another is, um, you know, as a country, uh, our public health system is, is broken. It doesn't work for a lot of people already. As we know, uh, African Americans and people of color have been so disproportionately hit by COVID-19 that you wouldn't know what country we lived in um, if you just saw the, the results. You know, Prince George's County is right, right outside the District of Columbia. It has one of the wealthiest African-American populations in the country. And yet it also has the most deaths and cases of COVID-19 of any county in the state of Maryland. So this is not just an issue about um, economics. Uh, this is an issue where how do we make sure that all communities in our country are able to deal with their underlying health conditions, have access to affordable health care and insurance, and that, you know, if God forbid we ever face something like this again, um, that we're better prepared to deal with it. And then I think lastly, in terms of structural change, we have to, um, we have to do everything it takes to uh, uh, put people on a more economic, e economically sustainable level. Um, you know, people who are in a, were in a tough economic position before this COVID-19 pandemic are in even worse straits right now, and they're dealing with health issues. Um, and so this just kind of reinforces my, my underlying philosophy that we need to get everyone onto the up escalator of the economy um, and make sure that, uh, you know, uh, the full promise of America is available to everybody, not just a privileged few. Absolutely, Congressman. So just one last question, because I know we have a hard, uh, uh, you know, deadline for the half hour block. So, uh, Congressman, when, when do you think we're going to see the first pre uh, president of South Asian descent? Ha. Um, I, I don't know, but I think it's coming. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, the fact that uh, we now have four members of the House who are uh, South, of South Asian descent, I affectionately call us the Samosa Caucus, uh, is a start. <laughs> we need more Samosas. We need Samosas in New York and everywhere else. But, um, on a more uh, serious level, I think that our community is awakening politically. I see it everywhere I go. And it's only a matter of time before we build the momentum to, uh, to continue our upward ascent and making sure that we're at the uh, table uh, for important decisions affecting our community. However, it all depends on one thing, which is, you know, you never walk alone. Um, you have to walk together and join hands with other communities and advocate for the best interests of our country and all people. And uh, to the extent we do that and we do it effectively and convincingly, uh, we will continue to rise. Thank you, Congressman Chris Murthy. Uh, what are you doing for 2024? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say 2024? Correct. I, tell you, I don't know what I'm doing for lunch, man. <laughs> it's about lunchtime here. So, All right. thank you so much, Congressman. Hey, thanks, it was man. great having you. Really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. And, and I so enjoyed uh, visiting uh, New York and Sabini and uh, addressing everybody back in October, I believe. And uh, uh, I look forward to uh, meeting everyone again. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for serving as our keynote. Really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.